Well, good morning. Um, well, this is a little bit... <laughs> I might need a box next time if, the, if, I, if I pass the cut this time. Um, it is uh, always a privilege to, to share in God's Word. And, you know, as I was planning and preparing for this morning, I thought, well, it's Trinity Sunday. I'm a Bible teacher. Should I just go Trinity, like full-out teaching? And I thought, no, that's a big bite to chew off for a, a first time speaking. And I thought, well... You know, maybe I should just say I'm going to do something controversial just to make Pastor J.D. sweat, but that didn't seem right either. And then I thought, well, it's Derby Day, so maybe I should do something like, you know, Paul and finishing the race, but I resisted that urge as well. And so because I am a Bible teacher at Cedar Park, what I've just been studying and praying as we kind of prepare for our next year there is this idea of God's Word telling one story. And so I love um, working with youth and helping them see that the, the scripture speaks one story from beginning to end. It's the story of Jesus. And so I've personally just been studying through the Old Testament, and I was in Ezra, and that's where we landed for this morning. We're going Old Testament this morning. Isn't that good? Come on, don't you love the Old Testament? I feel like the Old Testament just doesn't get enough attention. Uh, one of my first series here uh, with you all was when Pastor JG was going through Exodus, and I was like, oh, this could be my church. This, yeah, yep, yeah, this could be it. So um, as I was in uh, Ezra and, and, and looking at the, the period in Israel's history where they were rebuilding the temple, when I was, as I was studying that, I realized, you know, this story is it, it's so much it's so layered but one of the things that we can pull out of that is the reality that sometimes faith in our in our journey with jesus includes fallen expectations it includes periods where there are disappointments in life and so learning to walk faithfully in submission to christ even when things don't look the way that we would expect or hope is is such a I think fitting t and timely reminder for where we find ourselves today even as the people of God right and so that's where we're gonna go and you know as I was looking at um, you know defining like fallen expectations how would we define that I went to the Google because that's what all the teenagers in my life tell me to do and Google says that you know a fallen expectation is really when something's not as good as you thought it would be and I thought, okay, well, what are some examples? What are some good examples of, like, fallen expectations? And, you know, you should, I'm new to you, so you should get to know me a little bit. You know, I'm single. And if you got married before the age of online dating, don't talk to me. I, I don't want to know your story. I don't want to hear the cuteness. Just keep it to yourself, okay? <laughs> because this is how I feel about dating in the real world. Now we can put that first picture up. I mean, at this point in life, I don't want Prince Charming. I just want, I want the housework done for me, you know? You know, when you're young, you know, you just, and you're a girl, you know, like, I want someone who I can talk about art with and who's so sophisticated. And I'm like, I just want someone who can fix something in my house when it breaks, right? Like, it's amazing how our expectations and our desires change over time. You know, and then, and then maybe, Pastor, Pastor J.D., this, this actually might be where things get a little controversial, because the other example of fallen expectations I thought of was here. <laughs> now, I don't want to create any division, so I won't say where my fallen expectations came about with this series. But we can all agree that this is a pretty good example, yes? And so um, uh, we can turn to the book of Ezra this morning, and we are going to read about a, a time of mixed uh, reaction in the people of God. And, and as you turn there, either on your, your mobile device, or I, I know that there are Bibles there in front of you, you know, a little bit of context here. Uh, Israel, the, the, the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was, um, it was destroyed by Babylon about 586 BC, and that included the temple. And then, you know, as Israel is carried off into exile in Babylon, uh, Babylon over time is going to eventually come to be conquered by Persia. And, you know, we know from the, the biblical story that, that captivity was going to be about 70 years total. 
And so we're jumping into the story here of Israel's history. After some waves of, of um, Israelites have returned from exile, there's going to be some rebuilding. And uh, here are some key players you might need to know, you know, if you are recently married or expecting, you know, keep these names in mind. So Zerubbabel, you know, uh, a governor, he's going to be kind of a, a leader figure. Uh, he actually was a descendant of King Jehoiakim, who was the king when they went into Babylon. So, so kind of some personal history there. We're going to have Ezra, who's a priest and a scribe. We won't meet Nehemiah in our, our section today, but he was also going to be a, a reformer that kind of fits into the same general time period. And we have Joshua, who is a high priest. So those are kind of the, the key players as we jump into the book of Ezra, starting with verse 7. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyr, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea and Lebanon to Joppa, as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of, son of Shutiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from the captivity to Jerusalem began the work. They appointed Levites, 20 years old and older, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord, as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love towards Israel can, endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. It's so interesting that you have all these people that are seeing the same work be done and yet there is such a mixture of emotion and reaction that is happening within the people of God. You know, you think about it, God has been faithful. He has brought them back from captivity. You know, we all know that verse that we love so much in Jeremiah 29, 11, like I know the plans I have for you. This is actually the context, right? That he was gonna bring them back from captivity and he has done that. So God has been faithful to Israel. And yet there are people in the crowd who remember the former temple, the one that had been destroyed before they were taken off to Babylon, Solomon's temple in all of its glory. And the foundations of this temple just don't compare. And so there are shouts of joy and there are cries of sorrow. And I think it's, it's fitting for us to recognize that even within a, a, a similar context, even within one period of time, even within the same event, the faithfulness of God and the reality of disappointment and fallen expectations are not mutually excuse, uh, exclusive. That we can recognize that God is good, that we can recognize that he is faithful, and yet walk through very difficult, troubling times that don't match the hopes that we had or the way we thought something would be. In fact, if you, if you know scripture, you know it's not written chronologically. So the book of Ezra that we just read from is one of the historical books, but this, later in, in scripture we get like all of the prophets grouped together. So what I want to do is I actually want to walk to another passage of the Old Testament from the book of Haggai and hear how God responds to the people in this particular moment. So we get the story here in Ezra, 
And then we get actually kind of a picture of God responding to the people when we read the minor prophet Haggai. And so this is from Haggai chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, declares the Lord. Oh, be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains with you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, isn't that interesting that God sees the discouragement of his people? He, he points it out. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't tell them, hey, don't feel this way. He doesn't, he doesn't like demean the fact that they're recognizing that this is not the same, but he basically is telling them in this passage, remember me. Because we see in verses 4 and 5 that when he sees the discouragement and he speaks to the governor, the leader, he speaks to Joshua, the high priest, and to the people, he's speaking to the entire group that is here to do this work of rebuilding the temple, but yet are discouraged. He says, I am with you. Be strong. Remember that I am with you now in the present. But he also references the past. He references the fact that he brought them out of Egypt. Remember what I've done for you and be reminded that I'm also here with you now. In verses 6 through 9 of that passage, we then see that he says, I'm going to shake the heavens and earth once more. Now, if you were with us when Pastor J.D. walked us through uh, Exodus, that, that should be very reminiscent to the reality of, of Sinai and, and then what God was doing when he first covenanted with his people. So here in this place where God has brought them again out of a difficult situation, but where it's still not quite what they hoped it would be, he is reminding them of what he has already done. But there's some tension in this passage because... He's reminding them that, he, that he's faithful, but he's always still kind of pointing to something that he hasn't yet finished, that is still to come. This idea of the desire of nations is talking about Jesus. It's talking about this, again, a, another covenant that is coming. So remember what I've done, know that I'm with you, and know that I still have things I'm going to do that you haven't seen the fullness of this promise fulfilled just yet. And the idea that this, this current house, right, that the temple that they had just laid the foundations for, that they kind of, it, it kind of sounds from Haggai that, that they had been discouraged and they almost wanted to stop working. And he says, no, continue the work, continue to build and finish the temple. And that the glory of this house, even though it looks like less now, is going to be better than Solomon's temple. It points to the fact that Jesus is coming. And there's, there's a little bit of discussion among scholars because we know that Jesus as a baby is presented in this new temple, right? But it also points to more than that. It points to Jesus himself, who is the temple. And again, if you were with us in that, that time in Exodus, I, I love that Pastor J, J.D. pointed this out, that John chapter 1, verse 14, we can put that up and read together. It says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father 
full of grace and truth. And that word dwelling, this idea of, of a tabernacle, that Jesus himself is continuing this picture from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament because all of it is a story about who Jesus is and what he's going to do. And we get bits and pictures of, 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 of his people in all the different points as the story progresses. We also see in John chapter 2 that Jesus calls himself the temple. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. We see another re uh, reference to that in Revelation 21, 22. It says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So this idea that the passage in Haggai, yes, it is talking about the fact that, that Christ will be presented there, but it also hints at so much more. It hints at who Jesus is himself. And we think about the fact that we live in a world that is broken. I mean, you don't even have to read past the first few pages of Genesis to see how broken and dysfunctional this world is, right? I mean, and, I, and that's actually one of the things I love about God's word is it doesn't hide from the brokenness. It doesn't try to put a band-aid on it and say, well, it's really not that bad. Actually, it is that bad. It's just that God is faithful and he is good and he has a plan and he's not surprised by it and he's working it out for his purposes. I find that comforting. Our fallen expectations will occur as long as we walk with Jesus, because we are walking with Jesus in the midst of a broken world. So we think about Israel being carried off, watching the temple be destroyed, being in captivity in a foreign land, coming back so hopeful, yes, seeing the goodness of God, and yet this just isn't quite what they had hoped it would be, because this is not the ultimate promise. Jesus is the ultimate promise promise. And anything that we put our hope in, our expectation in, apart from Christ himself, will lead to a fallen expectation. It will lead to disappointment. So that job that we pursue, that promotion, we, we, we get it, right? I mean, if, if success and wealth was where you found happiness and security and hope, then Hollywood would be the best place in the world. But I don't think that's necessarily what we see, right? This idea that Jesus is the ultimate hope. So God says to them, remember me because I am with you. Remember what I have already done for you. It's interesting to me when we think about these two um, kind of bringing backs that God does in his people. You know, he, he delivers them from Egypt, and they're enslaved there, not because of their own sin, but for other factors. And God is working in that purpose, and there's, there's some difficulty, but there's some, some things about that that, you know, it wasn't the, the choice of Israel to be enslaved by the Pharaoh. It happened to them. But then we look at, we look at Babylon and, and the captivity that came, and, and that is caused by the fact that God's people did rebel and that there was sin, that, that, that they just went unrepentant for so long. And God warned them, I'm going to allow this because of your sin, but I'm still going to bring you back, and there's hope in that. But if we look at these two situations of Israel, I think we see a lot of similarity to the, to the suffering in our world even today. That there will be pain and suffering that you walk through that is of no choice of your own. We live in a, a fallen world, things happen. And there's pain, and there's suffering, and there's grief. And God does redeem it. The hope is, and, and the promise is that God will redeem that. There is also suffering and pain that is brought about sometimes by our own choices. And yet God says, I can redeem that too. So out of these, both of these scenarios, God points to the fact that he is the ultimate redeemer of every circumstance so he says hey know that i'm with you be encouraged by what i've done but know that you're still waiting 
You're still waiting because I've got more to do. And friends, while they were waiting for the first coming of the Messiah, we find ourselves at this part in the story still waiting for his return. The hope of ultimate redemption. That Christ is coming back. But in the meantime, I think the words that, that are spoken here to Israel are so fitting for us today. I am with you. I've been faithful in the past to my people. I still have promises to fulfill for my people. But right now, I am with my people in your brokenness and in your sin. In your times of celebrations. In your disappointments. That I am with you. And so I think we find this morning that there could be parts of the people of God that are in, like those who were shouting for celebration at the foundation being laid, that they find themselves in a season of celebrating what God has done. That is certainly true, watching the profession of faith this morning of our young people. I mean, there, church, there is no greater exciting factor than seeing young people who say, I'm going to follow Jesus. This is my faith. I own it. Come on, that's a celebration. There's graduation uh, right now of, of high school and college and, and celebrating accomplishment and what God's doing in people's lives. There are certainly elements of celebration even in our body here this morning. And yet there might also be in our midst those who are weary with the weight of discouragement. That perhaps, yes, You're walking with Jesus, but it's just not quite what you thought it would be. You know, corporately, when we think of, you know, greater than just our local church body, I think we could be weighted down by the division in our country. We could be weighted down by recent events of of such grotesque violence. We could be weighted down by reports of abuse in the church that's weighty. That's discouraging. Because the longer you're in church, right? Again, not, not talking about our local body. Our local body is fantastic. I just became a member last week. But when we think about the church in general, the longer you walk with the church or Jesus, you know, in the church, there will be times of fallen expectation that the church will not live up to the one it is called to represent. And that is weary and weighty. I think individually there can be times where life and relationship and work and all these things that we spend so much of our time doing, they, they, don't, they don't meet the expectation. Or maybe there's long-term chronic pain or suffering or sickness. Maybe life's a little more lonely than you thought it would be, whether you're single or not single. Loneliness is no respecter. This idea that the world that we live in is hard. And yet we're reminded, like the people of Israel, that God says, I am. I am with you. Don't forget that I've been with you. Don't forget that where, where I've brought you from. Don't forget that I'm a God who moves. I'm with you now too. Keep doing the work. Don't you love that he tells Israel, don't get discouraged that it's not everything you thought it would be. Just keep doing what I've called you to do. Keep building. And just know that I'm still at work and there are things that you have not yet seen that will pale in comparison, that are so beyond what you could even imagine, that the desire of nations is coming. Oh, the hope that that should stir in our hearts. So let us remember and let us be encouraged. And if you are in a a season of discouragement or fallen expectation, uh, you know, I, I, if, as you get to know me, you'll know a little bit about my story, but uh, I was in an accident about 10 years ago, uh, a little over 10 years ago now. And so there has not been a day in that 10 years that I have not been in physical pain. If you want to have coffee and hear about my story, well, I love conversation and coffee. But I, I, I identify with this in my own heart, in my own life. Not a day in 10 years that I've been not in pain. 
So I don't say this lightly. I don't say this as someone who has not met the, the, the weary weight of discouragement that I'm talking about. And in, and in this season of my own life, I want to share a passage that I find so just encouraging and comforting as we talk about this. And it's from 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet in, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, the challenging part about that verse is that our, our troubles, they don't often feel light or momentary, if we're being honest, right? but in perspective of what God has done and what he is still to do. You know, that temple that they were building in Ezra, it was destroyed again by Rome. It wasn't the temple that their hope was in, the physical temple. It was Jesus. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen? Will you pray with me?